welcome to An Evening with Nirvana. It's a podcast where I talk to various guests from the Dune community about level design, map making, and content creation. Today on the show, I'm talking to Razik, creator of maps for Slaughterfest 2012 and Slaughterfest 3, as well as the fantastic Neon Crater and the Kako Award runner-up, Judgment. You might also know them for their speedruns, which include Swim with the Whales, Stardate 2066, and Swift Death, among the nearly 300 demos they've submitted to DSTA. Welcome to the podcast, Razik. How are you doing today? I am doing excellent. That's good. good to be here. Yeah, exciting stuff. Lots of um things to touch on for sure. And we will start with, of course, the the thrill ride of a question. How were you first introduced to Doom? Oh, wow. Um, so it would have been a long time ago. It's actually amazingly one of my earliest memories. I um hmm. would be probably three years old or four years old i think i was sitting on my mom's lap and i can remember sitting there and she was playing ultimate doom uh i believe it was e2 episode two um and i remember seeing a cacodemon and, and calling it a tomato <laughs> and all of that stuff it it was a it was interesting at the time like I, I was afraid of it um and then i remember after that uh i found the old doom 95 disc I guess that came with our very first computer. Uh, and I tried to run it on like probably Vista and it didn't run very well. Um, and from there, I kind of, I always knew about Doom from there and I didn't really dive into it until about the end of 2010. Uh, I discovered GZ Doom and I was messing around with a lot of that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually sat down and played through all the, the IWADs, you know. Um, and then I discovered Doom World, uh, and started learning custom content, or learning about custom content stuff, and playing through a bunch of that stuff. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's uh kind of been there the whole time. It's just uh, I didn't really dig into it about uh, a decade ago now. Yeah, and so when you played through those iwoods, uh, which of them did you? sort of enjoy the most do you think i would definitely have to say plutonia okay i think i think most people know that i kind of uh kind of revere plutonia a little bit <laughs> which mm -hmm. might be uh uh not what most people like i i believe but it's kind of a meme honestly um the whole disliking plutonia thing i think it's not the best. I'll admit, it's not the best by any modern standard, for sure. But I think out of all the iwads, I definitely enjoyed it the most because of the challenge that it kind of had, especially when I was first playing. Right. Well, I do think probably out of the iwads, it probably holds up the best in in terms of modern standards of gameplay. Yeah. Yeah. It's it, for what they had at the time, considering what you could compare it to from from way back when i'd say it definitely holds up better at least i think i don't know i do feel like there's a little bit of like a uh there seem to be a lot of people now who i guess they can't they've come into the doom community they've never played the iwads at all and they they've just played p world content and the iwads just seem like almost unnecessary to them which is very strange yeah, I, I can agree with that. Uh, I mean, you see pictures of, or gameplay of, of PWODs and stuff like that. And uh, if you didn't know at all about what the iWODs actually are, you'd probably just dismiss them as lower quality old stuff and not really think about it, I guess. It's sad. It's a sad state of affairs. <laughs> it's, it's unfortunate. <laughs> I think... Uh, maybe the ports of of the original games to you know like the consoles and stuff like that sort of keeps them relevant since they're original game you know and in mm -hmm. uh people who didn't have knowledge even of the games have played them now so maybe that keeps it relevant now i mean i would probably still put a lot of them in terms of quality over you know like 70% of PWO content, to be fair. I think the other thing is that people are a little... There's a little bit of bias where they... 
are comparing them to the highest quality PWODs that are out there. But they're, you know, there's a decent amount of not very good PWODs that are released, so. Yeah, there, I mean, there's a lot of content out there. Um, yeah. Most people will probably never play 90% of whatever is out there, you know? So, and then all the popular stuff, of course, yeah, it's it's all this high quality stuff and it sticks out because it's it's beautiful looking or it's this really challenging gameplay or really fun stuff. And yeah, you like you say, you go back to the original game and it, it's not quite the same and most people would just dismiss it, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's really fair to compare like Sunlust to Doom 2 or something, you know. No, not at all. Yeah. They didn't even have an editor remotely close to the same thing to even try and produce something like that in a similar fashion, you know? Yeah, well, they also didn't have the points of reference that the iWads offered to create something like that. They were creating, you know, they were building Doom as it was, so, you know, very different thing. Um, so on the Doom wiki, at least, uh, Slaughterfest 2012 was sort of listed as your first credited release, I guess. Was this, like, the first time that you worked in the editor, or, like, when did you start getting into making your own maps? Ah, well, like I said about how I kind of came into the fold with the Doom community, and I discovered GZ Doom originally, it was, like, the, the main port back then, I guess. Just, mm-hmm. you know, it, it was the flashiest one, so it stuck out. Um, I actually really dove into modding stuff using Decorate and um, UDMF format and all that stuff. Yep. So I actually still have it somewhere on my computer. Uh, I have quite a few levels from way back then where I sort of piddled around in the editor and, and was learning it, and, you know, it's nothing nothing great it's a lot of 64 wide hallway stuff and and short rooms and stuffed full of monsters and all kinds of weird decorate stuff so Mm -hmm. i never released stuff like that um i did have something at some point that was actually a precursor to that slaughter fest map the first slaughter fest map that i submitted to the to the project uh it was the e4m1 kind of uh tribute map yep. thing um and i actually posted that but i think it kind of got lost at some point probably probably when the forum stuff were changed mm-hmm. um but yeah slaughterfest 2012 that was the first maps that i really like made and, and spent a decent chunk of time on uh like refining and and in the editor messing around with it balancing and and play like going through the whole development cycle to making maps and stuff like that Mm -hmm. and what so you sort of play the iwads and stuff and what custom pwods led you to wanting to like play and and make slaughter stuff i had a big thing about uh plutonia 32 actually uh go to it Mm-hmm, yeah, that's kind of like a proto slaughter map, right? Um, man, it's been so long; it, it'd be hard to say exactly which ones in particular kind of guided me on that path. Um, probably, the probably hell revealed, I would say. Um, just because it was, I think it, it's on the top one hundred wads of all time list, right? I, I kind of vaguely remember going through that and just checking it for for more and more uh interesting looking things to play mm-hmm. um and i kind of like i kind of thought it'd be fun to have these big maps full of monsters and 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 just you know sit there and blow them all away it kind was, of that mindless gameplay style and was like difficulty something that you generally uh sought in other games before before like getting into custom stuff and doing um not really uh before i really dove into doom um i was kind of big on fps shooters 
multiplayer shooters and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So like uh Call of Duty 4, uh oh, yeah. Halo 3, yeah. Battlefield, you know. Oh, yeah. I really dug into those kind of games and and I mean, I thought I was pretty good at them. I, it's you know, it was just a hobby. Uh so I don't really think the difficulties what attracted me to it. It was kind of just the experience really more of it i think like overcoming this this thing in front of you to to just uh see it all the way through and it kind of felt rewarding in its own way right maybe some of that like competitiveness coming through right even in your single player stuff um so you said you you sort of made a remake of um e4 m1 uh was that like a favorite map of yours? Is that why you wanted to do it? Or, or was it just sort of like a fairly simple layout you thought you could work with for like a first attempt? Or, or why did you choose to remake that? Um, I had an idea. Because, uh, you know, doing like episode one remakes is a kind of a thing that a lot of people gravitate to. And I, I thought this to myself, I wanted to be different. So why don't I do episode four instead? Right. Um. And so I started with that, and then I actually made one around E4 and 2, but that that one's been lost to time at this point. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of just it, it was kind of just the idea to be different, and it was around then I guess that Slaughterfest kind of started taking off, and it's like, well, you know, why do this by myself when I can put it in this project with all these other types of maps that kind of fit the same idea and. I ended up making two more maps for Slaughterfest 2012. Yeah, and I what I found was that all of your maps for SF 2012 they're quite different in terms of content, uh, in terms of combat. Sorry, like map 11, which is the E4 M1 remake, that's a bit more incidental, and then I think 13 is like very focused on set pieces, and 21's a bit more like open. Uh, sort of big open area and then gets flooded with monsters. Were you sort of deliberately playing around with different combat styles or did this just sort of happen naturally as you were mapping? Um, I would, I I think it's probably more deliberate. Um, when I was making, um, the second map, the, the kind of set piece focus one, um, I had an idea of what I wanted to do, kind of like the the basic crossroad style map layout and just have these sections where they were just big arenas full of monsters. It, it probably came as part of playing through some of the other levels that were being posted uh, for the project. And yeah. I would, you know, do a little play testing. I, I don't know if you call it play testing or just playing the maps. I don't think I really gave too much feedback about stuff mm-hmm. back then, but um, that's the second map was kind of just trying to figure out how to to set things up like that it's just do set piece stuff um the third map was i want to say i kind of just wanted to make a big open area and i had this really grandiose plan of having just a giant swarm of stuff come in from all angles but that wasn't really working out how i wanted to um so it kind of just became each section of the map was separate separated from one another and then it just happened to be everything floods in all at once and you know you just run around and there's ammo and stuff everywhere and i, I guess it kind of just established the or not established but uh it, it became a, a normal slaughter map I, I guess right and having played and you know also speed run and made maps and stuff for like older slaughter woods. What do you think sort of separates that older style from more modern slaughter? Uh, let's see. If I had to really describe it, I think the modern take on slaughter really has a much more intelligent kind of design plan behind it, mm-hmm. where like players have developed all of these strategies and a lot of the people who play these types of maps are the ones who are making these types of maps, right? So they kind of design fights with these things in mind. So, you know, there's all these, like, 
they're not really intricate, but they're you know very specific patterns of movement that you can use to fight big groups of enemies. You know, uh, I've heard terms like a U strafe, circle strafe, yeah. uh, you know, stuff like that. And the older stuff, like you know, Hell Revealed, is just I'm just going to throw a thousand monsters in this big boxy layout and uh, give the player as much ammo as uh, they need and see what happens. There wasn't really, it didn't really feel like there was any kind of plan behind it. Uh, I think 20, Slaughterfest 2011 and 2012 really kind of developed a more focused approach to slaughter maps in general. Uh, there might be stuff from before that that I really haven't played before that might have sort of been the, the genesis of that. But mm -hmm. And do you find that you have a preference between like the older stuff and, and the newer, maybe tighter combat? I probably I would say probably the newer stuff I would prefer. Uh huh. It, it's a little more engaging, I think. You know, because you have to think sometimes about how to approach fights and and resource management stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, I noticed that you sort of um after sort of fest you worked on a bunch of community projects like Doom World Roulette and Mayhem twenty sixteen. Did you get involved with them, like, to hone your skills at all as a mapper? Or, or was it just sort of like, well, that sounds like fun. I'll just make a map for that. Well, um, so I did two maps for the two uh, roulette things. I think Alf Alfonso was the one who hosted those. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think those, they just sounded fun. Uh, you know, somebody gives you this random prompt to make a map, and you do your best to to sort of just build a map based around what that is. Uh, and it was a really interesting exercise. I I think you know it was two week. I think was the turnaround, maybe a month. I don't remember exactly. Um, and I felt like it'd be a good way to sort of yeah, I'd say honing mapping skill would would have, would probably have been a good way to describe the idea behind joining up stuff like that because i wanted to sort of develop a style i, I guess mm -hmm. and sort of figure out how to make a consistent uh go at a map because originally making stuff was a really slow process for me sometimes um and then Mayhem 2016, I was actually invited to make a map for that, right? Uh, by uh, by Mark Hake. Um, he DM'd me about the project, and uh, I don't remember exactly the way he worded it, but it was basically, uh, "How would you like to make this uh, 3100 monsters slaughter map for for Mayhem?" Um, and I was like, "Cool. How long do I have?" And he's, I think he gave me a month to make it, and so I was. I was on board with that, um, and that was fun. I guess uh, it, it's kind of, kind of, you know, bringing both parts of it because I had a little bit of experience making slaughter maps from before. Yeah, and I wanted to to get better at making, like, having a faster turnaround on making stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, what's crazy to me is that there was a deadline set for these projects and they actually came out within the deadline that's the crazy part <laughs> you mean the the community <laughs> like the, the community not... projects yeah yeah well actually the third roulette never did get finished oh there we go unfortunately <laughs> um i don't think many maps were made for that project in fact neon crater uh i took that map and put it into judgment because it didn't really have a home Right. Well, I played the solar release version of it. Uh, someone had posted it up on the forums, and um, I really liked that map a lot. I was wondering if there was any particular inspiration behind like the atmosphere uh, for that map, because it's sort of low-lit, and uh, I don't know, it's something unique about the way it looks that I enjoyed. Um... I'm not really sure that I had a a, a hold on, on the overall atmosphere of it. It kind of just built from the uh, the um, prompt that I was given. 
Um, but I think I think the contrast from from the neon crater part of it, you know, which was like the main part of the prompt that I was given, mm-hmm. it, it kind of just made sense to me that it, that it was like a dark and mystical kind of location for this this strange crater in the side of this hill or whatever. Uh, and it kind of just ended up that way, I think. It didn't really have a much of a plan aside from trying to make something that fit the prompt. Right. And how did you, like, start building that map? Because you had the prompt uh, of, like, the crater. Did you start by just, like, I'll just put down a big circle or something and then and then build inwards from that? Or did you start with just, like, the lighting features? Or, yeah, how did you begin? I think I probably... S- I probably started actually on the lower section of the map um, because I, I, I kind of developed an idea that the crater would be like the, f- the finale area. You know, mm-hmm. that's where the exit would be. There'd be a sizable little fight there or something. Um, because the prompt, if I remember what the prompt was, it was something like the neon crater above uh, something, something uh, paddock. And I didn't know what a paddock was. I had to look up what a paddock was. It's like a yard or something. Yeah, like um, a field. Brandon yeah, like a field or something. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I thought I kind of thought backwards the way it was given. So I would I probably developed the lower section first, and then built up to where that main finale area would be. Um, it's been so long. It's really hard to to fully remember exactly how that process would have happened but yeah. that seems like seems like how i would I would have done that's at least how i would approach it now i would say uh-huh uh distribution center uh i suppose judgment was technically in development already at this time but was this or like your first proper release with custom monsters and and things like that working in gz doom yeah, it uh it was and um it was actually it's actually based on one of the very first maps that I made, one of those really early mess around maps that I mentioned. Mm-hmm. Kind of just the layout really, um and then it expanded outward from that. Um and yeah, I, I it was another case of, hey, this looks like a fun thing to do, so I'm going to do it. And it was, you know, it was originally for uh, the Vine Sauce Mapping Contest, uh, yeah. which, which was uh, the year before, or probably a few months before. I, I don't remember exactly when. Um, so I, I really, I spent a lot of time in two weeks on making that whole thing, and <laughs> probably a little more time than I really should have at the time. Um, but yeah, I, I really dug in and, and wanted to explore how, uh, intricate of a layout, well, not, maybe not intricate, but how complex of a layout, uh, and all these cool things that GZ Doom really has to offer, which, you know, I, I like them. I'm just, I don't think for me that it really... It opens up too many possibilities almost. It makes it hard to do stuff just because it's too much. But I think what I produced in that amount of time it was restrained enough to be interesting enough to, to actually release by itself and not just be what entered into that contest. Um, and it when I actually released it later on, I did a bunch of changes to it to make it more... Uh, refined i guess right and i'm kind of interested because you started in gz doom and this wad was in gz doom uh or you know for gz doom i guess it would have been i'm not sure if udmf format was out if it was hex in format or whatever but um i'm curious why you didn't end up sort of moving into making more udmf stuff uh, and instead went sort of back to MBF. I I would say the most prevailing factor is uh, demoing, demo recording and stuff like that. Right. Speed running. 
uh, you know, because by this time I, I I had quite a few speed runs that I'd I'd done, or uh, I don't know, speed runs. They weren't really a lot of them weren't fast runs by any measure, um, but you know, demo recorded and 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 so so being in a mapping format that supports that kind of became important to me, and I thought it'd be cool if if you know what I was making would be accessible to speed running because it'd be really cool to watch people play what I made. I, I thought. Uh huh. Yeah, well, that makes sense. That is definitely. It seems like yeah, like uh, being too feature heavy or you know, not having demo compatibility. Those are sort of the main things that people rub up against when they uh, work with UDMF and stuff. Um, so Slaughterfest Three, obviously, these maps came out a long time after they were actually made. Um, but I guess I was curious how you felt like your mapping style or like sensibilities had changed between SF 2012 and making maps for sort of first three. How they would have changed. I think I, I definitely leaned into uh, the more set piece kind of focused style. Um, just based on, on the two maps that I made for sort of S three. Um, just just more like focused fights that make good use of the monsters that are there, not necessarily having um hundreds and hundreds of monsters at once. Right. And I guess like what I noticed was that your maps sort of they often avoid like super strict lock ins, like the uh, the opening of map four and sort of s three you can kind of you know run through and take the next fight and you know maybe combine fights a little bit. Do you think this is due to speed running and like wanting to keep the maps a bit more open for routing and stuff, or is that just how you tend to make maps i th I think it's uh I think it's more of a tendency that I just make maps that way uh because personally um you know, I've experienced maps where they have some some sort of lock in fight or s situation, and you can you can finish what's going on before the lock in is over. So you're just kind of sitting there waiting for bars or to lower or a door to open or something. Uh -huh. And I I, I I try to stay away from that happening at all in a map. Um, and then I don't like everything to be confined into a lock in or a set piece. Having incidental stuff in between. Or having some open-ended areas where stuff happens it makes a lot more sense to me. Just for for uh, breaking up the action in a map. Yeah, and do you tend to like build around speed running at all, or do you try to avoid it? Because I know that some people that I've talked to who are speedrunners, they they actually find that it ruins the speed run for them if they have like built in tech and stuff uh most of the maps that i've made were probably long before that i really understood a lot of speed running tech uh -huh. like glides or um you know uh, line def skips and and stuff like that i didn't really i didn't really consider pacifist gameplay style at all um you know things like that um and in fact when judgment was first released you know i kind of went through the two or three months of of release candidate and at some point i really dug into um making every map compatible with nomo and pacifist so that there'd be some way to complete every map in both styles Especially Nomo, um, like any lock-ins or anything, I, I set up ways for them to be much quicker in Nomo since nothing's really happening. It's right. just doors would immediately open and and stuff like that. Um, so, but probably if from from now on, I probably would think about stuff like that when I'm making maps. I mm -hmm. would say, but I don't know if I would intentionally add skips. Maybe if it was something difficult, which would be really fun to to um, witness someone do, 
you know, it'd be really cool to see somebody accomplish something if it was really difficult. Um, and you or figure it out even and, and like if I if you knew about it, no one else did, but someone figured it out, that'd be really cool. Mm -hmm. Um, so what kind of things did you do then to make it faster for Nomo? Like how did you make it so that you could get out of lock ins quicker in Nomo than uh when monsters were present and stuff? Uh it's it's really simple, really. Um I would just take any kind of if there was like a you know, well most stuff um would have a voodoo scroller closet or something somewhere. Um and I'd just take everything that's going on in there uh and I'd I'd condense it down to a smaller closet that was just whatever was necessary to to open the area. And when monsters are on there would be a single lost soul floating there to block the voodoo from moving so that it, uh, it wouldn't function for someone playing an ultraviolence. Mm -hmm. But obviously in Nomo, lost souls are that special exception where they're monsters, but they don't count for kills on the kill percentage. So they yeah. do get removed, but they don't count. Mm -hmm. I, uh... um, and there's there's some other people that do similar things. Like uh, I know a lot of people will do like a one of the big trees sitting right next to a uh, a wall to block a, a a voodoo scroller or something. So it's it's not like yeah, I think it's not Andrew anything too that. complicated. Yeah, that's some of his stuff. I mean, I use the lost soul thing in in fractured worlds actually uh, for difficulty setting stuff. But um, one thing I had to do was go back in GZ Doom and uh, I had to use decorate to replace the lost soul. Uh, oh, to make it yeah. not count to kill percent, because for some reason in GZ Doom it does count to kill percent. <laughs> so, yeah, that's kind of a default thing. I I don't remember exactly how I changed that, or if I did or not, for the final release of Judgment. I might have, but uh, yeah, I just noticed. I really... Um, or I think maybe Gazebo was testing for me in GZ Doom, and he was like, "Oh, like." I can't get 100% on this or whatever. And I was like, what? <laughs> it turned out I was like the lost soul in the in the wall. Oh. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure why they have it that way. But it's kind of always been that way from what I remember. So, Well, I read a thing with Graf, and he, I think his reasoning was that... I can't remember what the exact numbers of the release are, but in the original Doom shareware release the Lost Souls counted towards kill percent. So he made it right. the same as that. Which Probably yeah. before Doom 2 and the Pain Elemental. Exactly, yeah. Which he claimed was like a lazy reason to remove it from kill percent. Uh, and so that's why he reintroduced it. Which I don't know if I agree with necessarily, but you know. Here we are. Yeah. Um. So in terms of judgment... Talk to me about like the early beginnings of that ward because it it started a long time before it was finally released. Quite a while ago. Um, so it was actually uh, 2013, the summer of 2013. I remember it. I I sat down to make the first map that I made, which would have been map one. Um, which is it isn't the same map that's actually in the wad now. Uh, I lost that map to uh unfortunate Slade incident. Oh no. <laughs> um, um but I did remake it as close as I possibly could remember how it was originally. So it's essentially the same. It's just not exactly the same. Um uh, but regardless, uh I had a dream about Doom and I had a dream about that map. Um it was kind of just like a general view of it that I saw it was a lava filled crater. There were some mine shafts. Uh I remember the mancubus sitting on the on the rock to the side shooting at me the whole time. And I kind of just took that idea and I threw it down in the editor and I looked at it and I'm like, this is kind of cool. It's not a slaughter map. It'd make a great map one for something. I'm going to start making more focused maps like this and see what happens. And uh, I kind of just started laying out these ideas and um, throwing four or five of them together and building a map based on those ideas. Like I, I had a, I had a list. I'd just write. I'd have ideas pop into my head during the day, and I'd just write something down in the list for later. And uh, that kind of 
took care of the first half of the wad really for the first three or four years that I was making maps. Mm-hmm. And was the plan always to have like a lot of custom monsters? And were you working with D hacked originally, or did it start as like a GZ Doom wad that then turned into Boom that then turned into MBF21? So, uh, I started in CL9 in Boom. Mm-hmm. Um, and I did have a little bit of dhack stuff going on. I, I took the SS guy and I turned him into just a quick shooting zombie man. So like in between a, a zombie and a chain gunner, right? Um, and I did something with uh, the Keen. I think I just used all the frames from the Keen and I did the Baron having two attacks at once. Or not once, but in succession. Just the small little stuff, and and that really kind of carried until um, about the start of 2016, I'd say. And that was after I played Valiant. And Valiant kind of really set me on this whole uh, exploration of how much, or how how much more custom can you get, and retaining that uh, demo compatibility. Um, so I bumped it actually up to MBF. 11 right um and i really i really like explored how how much i could get out of the dehacked stuff uh like i pulled frames out of as much stuff as i could to make it still function like doom would should feel like right yeah um like i i i pulled 10 frames out of the arch files fire animation uh to use for something i took every Every monster has like two states in their pain uh, states. So I took one of them from each of those and just made it one state. Same thing with their idle animation. So <clears throat> if you ever came across a, a sleeping enemy, they'd just be standing there. And it's almost menace- more menacing in a way when they were like that. But I'd take those frames. And, and um, it ended up in the original format after I did all that work for the dehacked. Uh, in MBF 11, um, I actually had almost everything that was in Judgment there. Right. Wow. And yeah, it is actually. I honestly wish I had kept a copy of that dehack because it was, it was, somewhat impressive. Even to me, I like. I was honestly kind of impressed with how much I pulled out of there. Um, I had all four of the variant uh, zombie men. I had the, the nightshade. The the fallen, the you know, the flaming skeleton, revenant-looking guy, um, mm-hmm. the big archon. Um, I think the only real thing that got added after I I swapped over to MBF twenty one was the baby cacodemon and the um, the secret boss, the shaman. Right. I mean, this all sounds very reminiscent of. I remember Ribix when he was making jump. What showed me sort of the states list and stuff and what he'd done i mean he didn't have any monsters obviously so he ripped a lot more out but um it is interesting (laughs) what you have to do to accomplish those types of gameplay changes in like the old dehacked format it's uh yeah it's 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 tricky there's a lot of things that can go wrong and there's not a lot of things to tell you what is going wrong so you kind of have to work with it a little harder to figure out exactly what you need to not do before you can really figure out what you can do. Yeah. Um seeing seeing signal 11 and and having the port just exit out with no error <laughs> happened quite a lot. Right. Uh but that was almost that was almost more fun than it was annoying just trying to figure out what to do. And so when did you actually decide to change to MBF21? Uh it was not very um long before I actually released the first release candidate. Uh, I started converting everything in like March, maybe April of uh, 2021. Mm-hmm. And did you, was Decker hack around for that? Or were you still using d Like a uh, whack I, I actually don't use either. I do everything in Notepad. Oh, wow. If you can believe it. Yeah, it's... um. I don't know if that makes it easier for me or what. It, it, I, it kind of made it a little easier for me to understand exactly how everything kind of works and and 
I keep everything organized, so I have everything situated in a way that's familiar to me. So I, I guess it's easier for me to do it that way. Um, but I use Wacked as a reference, usually. I don't know anything about Dehacked. I've, I've heard it's pretty simple. It's basically decorate, for the most part. Yeah, decorate hack, yeah, basically. Just functions the same as decorate, and then just converts everything into Dehack strings. Which... It's quite nice. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it'd be pretty easy to get a hold of and make things a lot simpler, but... Yeah. So, how much... Like, you have all these custom monsters and things. How much work went into, like, balancing them for the new sandbox and, and stuff? Was there, like, a testing process for each monster as you introduced them, or was it more just, like, let me put these in and then see how it plays and then do it based on that? So when I actually built the dehack stuff, um, I probably had a little more than half the maps already made. So it's uh, it's it's mostly like you said. I I just sort of put it all together, and then I just sort of threw it into the maps, and then I I would go back and just play through all the maps and see what worked, and see how that felt to to play against the monsters. And um, I did a lot of tuning on like health values and and how quickly the stuff attacks and how quickly they move just to really kind of put it into a um their own places cuz i always felt like there was some spots in the monster roster where there's holes like there's stuff missing and i kind of wanted to fill those particular holes and have a couple of things that were just cool like they they felt mm -hmm. new and and cool to 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 fight basically so what kind of holes in the in the sandbox do you feel like you wanted to fill um, I I I do believe that we're missing a kind of a low health, um, uh, high threat flyer. Um, mm -hmm. so basically the fallen, um, the the burning skeleton bird thing that I put in. Um, my idea was basically let me make a revenant that flies, and I gave it half health because it's you know probably going to be a much more annoying enemy to fight most of the time. Um, so yeah, like a low, low HP flyer was something that I really thought was missing. Um, and then I think probably the, the biggest other thing that I wanted to have was, um, sort of, it, it was kind of like the same role that an arch file has as like an area of denial tool, but not based on a line of sight attack. So the Azazel, which is the goat man with the wings, and he throws all the Mancubus fireballs. Mm -hmm. You put him in a hallway. He really fills that hallway up with fireballs. So you either have to duck out, or take cover, or really focus on him to get him down as a threat. And uh, I felt like that was a much more... Well, not my, uh, maybe just a different way to have this sort of area of denial threat rather than just plop an archfile down cuz archfiles introduce a lot of other gameplay elements at the same time. So right. And yeah, I mean it's interesting you talked about sort of valley and stuff because I I do feel like skill saw uh is some is like the main person that I think of when I think of like well done uh custom monsters introduced into the sandbox. Do you think there was like uh a decent amount of influence from the way like the the places in the um in the sandbox that skill so tried to fill as well i would say yeah um from valiant specifically um the arachnorb you know the arachnorb is that low health kind of almost a higher threat flying monster so mm -hmm. i really liked him um i wasn't too fond of him randomly spawning out of the dead arachnatron that really right, kind of right got annoying for speed running because i did i did some max runs of, of valiant um when it when it first came around um the um i guess the hell knight replacement the the pyro demon the one that has the spray of fireballs oh, yeah. uh, i really liked him so uh i that's what i kind of based my idea for the archon of hell that i put in judgment who is 
much tankier. He's he's above a baron. He's kind of like a mini boss, um, and he has that spray of attack uh, of baron fireballs and and his own little green uh, uh, fireball thing that he has. Um, I kind of wanted to do. I kind of wanted to add the uh, kamikaze guy, but I felt like it might be a little on the nose. Um, but right. I, I also couldn't. I couldn't really f- find a way to fit uh, him into the roster. I, I think so. I, I, I left that one out. Um, but the thought was there. The thought was there. I, <laughs> I did. I, I like the kamikaze guy. I always remember that one fight from Valiant. Um, I think it's it's in one of the the middle levels somewhere. You drop into this canyon with nukage and everything, and there's this platform in the middle, and, and there's just like 200 kamikaze guys. <laughs> and you get a super chain gun, and you just mow them all down. It, that was just really fun. And uh... Yeah, that's definitely a good enemy. Uh, one, of the, one of the better custom monsters, I think, in terms of... I don't know if they necessarily fill a like a gap in the sandbox, but they definitely make for like fun encounter design. I think as a mapper, right? Yeah, they're they're that they're that one part that's unique and different, and it it really it's it's something cool and it's new and it feels like it fits right. Because um, mm-hmm. I think that's another thing about dhex stuff is sometimes that stuff gets added to a project and it it feels like it doesn't really fit and it almost detracts from the experience a little bit. Yeah, maybe um yeah definitely a factor in some like Z Doomy things. I think steering yeah. further and further away from Doom for sure. Like stealth monsters. Well, you know, I think <laughs> there could be a place for them. I'm gonna make there a one be. entirely based around <laughs> stealth monsters. Yeah, if you if you really if you really set up something to utilize the stealth monsters, I, it could be fun. I think the it's stealth just... vial is kind of cool. I think that yeah. Works. You know, he just appears yeah. and suddenly he's attacking. You know, you could do some cool stuff with that, maybe. It'd be a good fit into like a horror kind of setup or something. Mm. Uh, so, judge... just... oh, sorry, you go. I, I was just gonna say that I've I played quite a few Zedium levels that kind of just sprinkle in stealth monsters, and they really, yeah. they really kind of kind of dampen the mood of the rest of the level. Yeah, they definitely don't work when they're just arbitrarily placed. I think. Right. Um. Yeah, so what I was going to get to is Judgment is, it's like fairly incidental, I guess, with, you know, set piece encounters throughout. Um, you have talked a little bit about how, like, your, your gameplay sensibilities have changed a little bit over the years. Do you think that these days that's sort of the gameplay that you, you tend to prefer is sort of uh, that mix of incidental with, with set piece stuff? Yeah, it definitely, definitely is probably what I, I'm more attracted to overall. Um, I like, I like some more challenging stuff here and there. Uh, I can't really name anything of recent, but you know things like Star Date Twenty X Seven, that kind of level of challenge stuff. Not necessarily slaughter stuff. Um, right. It's kind of weird. I, I kind of took a 180 on slaughter. I, I'm not really that big of a fan of of the large scale macro slaughter kind of maps anymore. I, I enjoy them. It's just I don't think personally that I'm the best player, uh, so I don't fully appreciate them sometimes, mm-hmm. just because I'm I'm not quite good enough to to play them without having to retry fights here and there. Um, but yeah, incidental and set piece style i think i definitely prefer that kind of thing because it it feels much more like um like intelligent design um uh, mm-hmm. and it's it's fun to like disassemble that kind of thing and, and figure out the best way to do something and and it adds another layer to gameplay i think and in terms of like making a a wad that spanned sort of eight years or or so uh did you end up going back to your earlier maps like constantly over the years and updating them? Like, did you feel that need to sort of go back and update the visuals or or change gameplay aspects that you maybe didn't enjoy anymore, or or did that Absolutely. not happen so much? Oh, did. Absolutely. 
Um, so, and, and the eight year time span actually was not on purpose, I would say. Um, because in 2016, I, I couldn't spend as much time working on it as I wanted to. Um, I, I had, uh, job responsibilities I had to take care of first and foremost. So it really limited the amount of time I could spend. Uh, I stopped speed running even just because I wanted to spend more time on mapping and stuff. Um, so uh, yeah, about that time after I finished doing all the dehack stuff and 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 going through all the maps that I'd already had, yeah, I did a lot of changes to earlier stuff. Um, like uh, even even like uh, map six, I completely remade that map because I didn't like the original version of it. It felt too small compared to what it is now. Um, so to fit everything with the changes that I made, I, I just kind of rebuilt it around the same general layout i just made it more expansive and made stuff uh more interesting to fight rather than just being three small scale slaughter fights really even though that's kind of what it ended up being anyways uh it just felt more engaging compared to how i originally built it Mm -hmm. um and i really I, i i i think more so i developed a visual standard that i i kind of build maps to i i was having problems with um like accepting what i made i guess i could describe it um like i didn't feel like what i was making lived up to like a community standard of 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 detail like they looked kind of plain and and i mean and it's just kind of personally how i felt about it so I started to just sort of work at stuff and figure out ways I can make things look more detailed without inhibiting gameplay or anything like that. So I'd go back to the older maps and I'd put in spots that were outside of the play space, but they added to the detail of the area, like you know, just ledges with stuff on it and open spots to the sky and texture changes and stuff like that. Um, and it was really after the first release candidate I did is when I really kind of went through and did a whole bunch of gameplay changes because I'd, I'd watch people play the maps and, and go through and, and figure out what was clunky or what could be approached in a way that made something not fun. I tried to make it where that wasn't uh, something that could happen, or at least it would minimize the annoyance that it could cause. Yeah. I mean, it must be difficult... <laughs> It must be difficult over that span of time. I mean, I know that even, like, even with Fractured Worlds, it wasn't so much a case of, like, you know, my sensibilities changing or whatever, but I would introduce new resources and stuff into the project, like new textures and and things like that, and then I would have to go back uh, into previous maps and, like, you know, I would put in a little bit of those newer textures so that there was, like... uh, more consistency between the maps i guess so uh, even in that sense i was going back and like editing things in previous maps over and over and over again uh so i could imagine <laughs> with so much changing in that period of time it, m- it must have been a challenge yeah it it did break a few things here and there and that was always fun to to deal with and yeah like you said going back and and having new resources that you you wanted to use and and they'd fit elsewhere and it ties everything together, you know, theme wise, yeah. especially on a shorter set like Fractured Worlds would be. Uh, I imagine would be a lot more involved with that kind of thing, just because you'd want everything to sort of fit together since there's less maps overall. Yeah, and I was already shifting theme a lot between maps, so I was attempting to keep some level of like cogency between them. Otherwise, uh, I feel like there was the threat of it all becoming feeling like a bunch of separate projects like smashed into one yeah like a compilation wad yeah exactly uh so i wanted to talk about speedrunning uh for a little bit because you've obviously done a bunch of mapping but you've also done a bunch of speedruns um was doom your first speed game or were there other games that you you ran before it was the first game that i took it any kind of serious and i would say um there in there was games that had 
time trial stuff that I did, and I enjoyed that kind of thing. So when I learned about uh, demo compatibility for for Doom uh, and and specifically UV Max stuff, which was kind of the way I like to play the game, it, was, it kind of made sense that I'd try it, and I kind of enjoyed having to go through levels, especially challenging stuff, and and do it in one life and and do everything in the map and and that 100% completion it just it felt really nice so mm-hmm. yeah doom is the first and the only speed game that i've really done right uh, do you think there's something that makes doom unique in terms of speedrunning i'm not sure if you sort of watch other speed games or or anything uh i've i kind of i don't really uh sit down to watch other games be speedrun uh, I, I kind of have a little bit of knowledge of some games that I, I enjoy here and there. Um, but I think what really sets Doom apart for speedrunning is all the custom content. The fact that it's not just the original games. I, I can't imagine the community would be as large as it was or is uh, if if it just was the original games that were being speedrun. Mm-hmm. Um, you have all these maps, all these levels of challenge, all these categories, all this. There's just so much to do and it's something for everyone and um that really sets it apart and i think that's why i enjoy it so much is there's so many different levels to play and, and all these levels that i really love i i only speed run things that i like playing so having so much stuff to choose from overall just makes it something i can do consistently right and i think one of the first times i ever became sort of aware of you was your speed run of swim with the whales map three um because i i mean i played that map and i really enjoyed the map and the wad and then i was like i can't remember if it was maybe it was youtube or maybe it was the actual demo itself but i just remember being like how the hell can anyone beat beat this map you know saveless um i guess i was curious what initially made you want to run that map that particular map is one of my favorite maps of all time so i was really inclined to to try and demo it um i i personally i think swim with the whales is is my favorite work by ribix um and and map three it just it had that sinister soundtrack uh it had like the surreal feeling of of almost hopelessness but at the same time it's a fair challenge um and at the time it was unlike anything i'd ever played up to that point and i just really wanted to to do it i wanted to be the first one to do it i don't remember if i was or not i don't think i technically was the first to get a demo on it but i think at the time i was maybe the quickest for a little while and uh and then much better players than i got a hold of it and brought the time down a lot but I just I I really was compelled by that map and I really wanted to get that demo. So I'd spent a lot of time doing it and mm-hmm. eventually uh got it. It was one of the best uh, things that I had accomplished by that point, I think. Right. And when you're running like a large challenging map like that, what's the first thing you do when you start speedrunning it? So a large map like that typically i'd have to go through to, and route it in a way that stuff that's really difficult needs to become easier to do consistently because if there's really hard things in the map you know that's where you're going to lose a lot of attempts you're going to get cornered and die and or run out of ammo and it's just going to be slow or you know something like that depending on if you're just trying to beat the level or if you're trying to actually make a good time Mm-hmm. So getting in and routing and and really breaking down individual fights or um certain segments, you know, learning where all the possible resources are, when to use them, when to grab them is is probably where I would start on a level like that. Um and then from there having to actually build the route and and kind of work through it over and over again to really memorize it and that takes more time the longer a level is obviously because you gotta keep track of all these things 
where every secret is, when to get the secret, how many of whatever monster you're supposed to have uh, uh, taken out by that point. And, and it's a lot sometimes. But yep. uh, bringing, bringing down those scary bits to a more manageable level is, is probably where I would say I'd start the most often. Um, and Because that's usually what has to go to get a faster time in the long run is is just throwing yourself at those hard parts and hoping that you can get out of them in mm-hmm. uh, in an attempt yeah and then it's sort of you practice each segment individually and then the challenge becomes sort of stringing those parts together so that you're like i go here now i go here without any pauses where you have to kind of think about where to go next i guess right and you also have to keep up a a little bit of adaptability because you might use a little more ammo than you're used to using, or you might have more ammo than you're used to having at certain points. Uh, so, you know, maybe you go into some fight and you have two extra BFG shots you can use, and that might might make things a lot easier, or you might save a little more time here or there. And for long maps like that, that can really make a difference. Yeah. I remember, I mean, I'm not a speedrunner by any stretch, but I did do a Sunless 25 run just because I liked the map when I was playing through it Sableless, and I was like, maybe I'll try and go for an okay time. And <laughs> in the one that I eventually just, like, I ended up posting up that run because it was, it was okay. But uh, I didn't realize I had all these extra rockets. Like, I'd done much better on a previous section. So when I got to the stair fight, I actually had all these extra rockets, but I didn't realize. So there's, like, this terrible point in the demo that I can never look at where... I SSG things for like a minute when I could have just rocketed them. And it always yeah. makes me cringe. Hate when that happens. Sometimes you can't avoid it because just because of where ammo is in the map. But I've had quite a few like uh, first exits on, on demo attempts where I'd leave the map and have like 400 cells left for a BFG. Right. And I'm just like, well, where can I use all these cells and, and speed things up? And Mm-hmm. That's yeah. That's probably the first thing that you start to revise once you start actually throwing down attempts. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I never learned to revise it clearly. But uh, uh, I was curious how much, like you talked about routing the map, but did that route sort of change over the course of the run, where you found sort of more optimal things? Because it's such a big map, I would imagine routing is like a big part of it. There, yeah. There is a lot of different ways to complete that map in different orders here and there um and i actually did two demos of that map the first one was kind of just in order i guess is the best way to describe it Mm -hmm. just taking on each part of the map as you get to it um and then i really sat down later on probably i don't remember the time difference between each demo but when i did the second attempt and took off uh over six minutes of time, um, I really kind of figured out more of which things I could do in what order to make it the quickest. Like, and it's been so long since I did it. I, I I kind of vaguely remember trying to get to the BFG much quicker, so I'd have access to it for other stages of the of the route before um, I would have on the previous demo that I did. Because because like I said the previous demo was really kind of just doing things in order and trying to survive because it it, you know it's not an easy map by any measure Mm -hmm. it is a pretty tricky map to actually play through but um right and what is like the toughest part do you think of that run is it the cyber fiesta or is it the the final fight uh the cyber fiesta is kind of it it's almost a meme really it's it's you're either gonna catch too many rockets or they're going to consistently infight with the things that are in the little windows um and getting there earlier in the route really helps with actually getting through attempts because you know it if you get unlucky you die and you have to restart right so i would say the cyber fiesta it's not really uh it's not the difficulty of that part that makes it uh difficult it's just the fact that you can get unlucky and there's not really anything you can do about it sometimes um if i had to pick what was the most difficult it'd definitely be the ending the finale fight in the um like the other 
realm part of the map um yeah. i mean even once you get there and you see what all is in there you you see that assembly of arch files and cyber demons and and uh all the turreted monsters and everything and it's it's really it's it's kind of scary honestly when you get to that far um cuz again there's just a lot of ways that you can get caught out and and just get annihilated before you can react to anything you know an arch file finds you and sneaks up on you in a bad spot or you get cornered by too many cyber demons at once uh but you know watching some of the other people who've done demos for that map they 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 figured out ways to approach those kind of things so yeah there's ways around it but i would say that's definitely the most difficult part for Mm -hmm. me would be the ending right and Stardate uh, 2066, that's another another ward that you did a lot of runs for. I think you have UV max runs for all of those maps. Um, did you have a favorite to run out of those, and maybe a least favorite? Ooh, it's been a while. Um, I would say my favorite run for that ward would probably be my map four. Probably map four. Mm-hmm. Um, least favorite I would say is probably the last map, map seven. Yeah. Uh, if only for the the ending. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna ask you about that because I, think I it was Zol who was running it, or a couple of people have run that map now. But that uh, that final fight is seems pretty inconsistent, I will say, and and very rough. I I still can't really think of a way to get past that and do it consistently. And I lost so many runs to that particular spot. It 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 kind of really just pissed me off more than it was uh supposed to, I guess. Um it it felt bad getting that far in the run and then just getting blasted seven times by our trials and not being able to really do anything about it. Um Yeah. It's been so long since I've played that map, though. I probably, I feel like I probably, if I revisited it and sat there for a little while and and figured it out, I could come up with something. But yeah, map seven of that one was probably my least favorite map to run. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, because it has that initial wave of like revenants and archviles and stuff. Well, first you have to do the big archvile fest at the very beginning. And then mm-hmm. it's the wave of remnants and vials, and then you get <laughs> that's the cyber demons on the podiums that you have to kill. So there's a lot of ways to just kind of get instantly killed. I don't think I don't think I really understood the concept of two shotting cybers at that point either. So I kind of just, if I remember, I, I kind of just threw everything I had at them from a distance and hoped they would die rather quickly. <laughs> right, because getting close to them was was at that point. Like um, the nerves, even getting that far, and and I remember being pretty low on health, and there not being anything else to pick up anywhere. I I just remember from a distance firing away at them, trying to bring them down without risking dying. Of course, did that end up being like a pretty satisfying demo, though, or were you just happy it was over? <laughs> really, it, that was definitely one of the instances where it was just happy. Like I was happy to be done with it. Like it was the f- final map, um, barring the secret map that I didn't actually do a demo for because I I don't remember if I even knew it existed at the time. Right. Um. Yeah. It was. Is like. Oh, it's over. I'm done. I beat it. It's it's relief. It was definitely relief. Um. And I don't know if I really felt as proud as I could about it, just because it felt like I got lucky more than anything, but. It definitely felt good to finally be done with it. You take those, I feel like. Sometimes you have to. I mean, <laughs> you can't you can't you can't just be the best at everything. There's only a few people that are the best at everything, right? At least when it comes to speedrunning. Well, I don't know if it's about about that. I feel like you can you can maybe not necessarily be the best, but you can be the best at a given map, you know, a given run or I feel like there's a lot of a lot of leeway to to make your own little place yeah true true um what was the appeal of swift death for you in terms of running it um the how short the maps were for sure right you know that was really the first time uh i, I kind of took on maps that were 
I mean, some are even less than a minute. Some are even, some are within the realm of of tens of seconds long. So it really kind of just opened up um, uh, putting multiple attempts at a time into into maps like that and, and actually trying to bring down times um, because a lot of a lot of the start eight 20x6 map uh, runs that I did were actually just first exits like I, I just got to the end and I didn't really do any kind of refining of routes and and stuff like that I, I was hmm. just trying to beat the maps really and uh, I just thought it'd be cool to post the demos I guess um, but Swift death really kind of got me into routing and and trying to do things as fast as possible and and figure out what what works where uh and and them being really short maps really really kind of facilitated that um because because back then you know we didn't have dsda doom we didn't have restart without closing out the port and loading up the batch file again and, and all that so yep it was it was really different mm-hmm and because the maps are so small and they're sort of built around pretty tight strategies a lot of the time, were there many opportunities for like improvisation or routing at all? Uh, some maps, from what I recall, were a little more open ended. There were some maps that were kind of just uh, built around like a central idea. So you just kind of had to go at that particular idea and try to do it as fast as you could um and that's usually the shortest maps were like that where uh you just get in there you accomplish you know killing the the 12 enemies that are in the map and and get to the exit real quick and Mm -hmm. um some maps had like 40 enemies and there'd be a teleport ambush here and another uh uh section where the wall lowers here and and you can go you know, one way or the other, and that that was more of uh, which way to which order of things do you do? Do you open everything? Uh, try to get infighting happening. You know, um, it, it it was merely dependent more on the map, but it was it was for the most part it was um, those open ended maps where you got the the changes in routing that you could really figure out. Mm-hmm. And do you find that you now like have a bit of a preference uh, between doing smaller maps and and doing longer maps when you speed run stuff, or is it more like is it entirely based on how much you enjoy the map? Um, it's definitely uh, definitely if I if I really enjoy playing something casually, um, I'll I'll want to to do demos for it to speed run it. Um. I don't know necessarily that there's anything that I've speed ran that I didn't enjoy. That I didn't like specifically set aside and want to do. Um, when it comes to shorter and longer maps, I, I'm kind of not really particular about it. I I would say, um, shorter shorter maps are nice because it's you know you do more attempts for them because they're not as long of a run so you can spend more time trying to improve them you know seconds by seconds uh and then you know there's longer runs like uh some of the more recent longer runs that i've done um there might be 15 minutes long of a a max run Mm -hmm. uh for for an individual level um and for a map like that, uh, refining it is is fun. Uh, but at some point, realizing gains is really taxing, and it it kind of drags it out a little longer than I I fully commit to sometimes. Right. So, yeah, probably around probably around that fifteen minute. 20 minute mark is probably the longest kind of map that I would want to do speed running for. Mm-hmm. So um, no D2Ls in your future. I've actually done some D2Ls recently. I D2Ls are different for me, I think. Um, um the long and actually the longest run that I've done is an hour and a half long D2L. Um 
and it's 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 kind of like the crown of of going through an entire set of levels is kind of what I approach it as. I like I like um what I've been doing recently is going from the start of a, a project and going through each individual level and and trying to really optimize individual levels and then at the end going through the whole thing in a D2L run. Um and it, for the D2L runs, it, it, once you do all that routing on individual levels, it kind of builds into this this route by itself for the for the D2L. It saves a lot of time on that initial stage of of doing an actual run, right? Um, there's a little little bit of prep that you have to do because you're playing continuous, so you have more resources usually. So knowing where you can utilize that kind of thing throughout the whole run overall. Uh, uh-huh. is is a little bit of work, but doing D2Ls, I've actually really enjoyed the, all the D2L stuff that I've been doing lately. So I'll probably probably stick to doing that. Um, yeah, it's definitely become a lot more popular over the last few years, I feel like, doing D2L runs. Maybe thanks in part to, you know, Derek doing Sunlust and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I, that definitely brought um, a lot of attention to these super long, challenging runs. Uh, I mean, you know, there's like Hell Revealed D2L. It, I don't know how recent. Maybe it's been pretty recent. Um, not that that's the most challenging thing, but, it, you know, that's like a six-hour run, and it's crazy sometimes. Um, we had... We've seen the UV fast each wall of Plutonia and TNT mm-hmm. uh, in the past year. So D- uh, D2Walling has become much more common, I-, I would say, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, so since Judgment, you've you know, you've worked on a few community projects, junk food and, and stuff. Uh do you have any new wads you're working on at the moment? Any new MBF twenty one shenanigans in the background? Hmm. Well, I have a plan for something. I've kind of started to assemble resources for, um, and it's actually I want to I want to kind of go back to to where I started. Um, I kind of want to build this focused episode of kind of medium scale slaughter maps. Mm-hmm. Um, that sounds good. That yeah, I'd incorporate my uh, kind of focused on set piece incidental uh, in between kind of style, just kind of combining all the three elements of stuff that I've done before and, and see what happens. Um, cool. And then there's uh, another project that I'm working on with some other community members. Uh, it's kind of under wraps for now. Right. I feel like that's usually the case when I ask these types of questions. <laughs> well, it it kind of lose its charm, I think, if it was completely out in the open. It's not exactly the most secret thing either. There's probably a bunch of people who will know what I'm talking about. Um uh but it's uh it's uh it's kind of a meme thing, so All right. I think to... I might be aware of it, yeah. Probably. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also I made a map for Tugers. And, oh, okay, uh, yeah. Uh, I don't know exactly how soon that's supposed to be coming out, but that should be interesting for some people, I think. <laughs> well, Tugers uh, was what I would, thought you were referring to as the music no, it's it, it wasn't actually the the other thing has been uh, an idea for uh, almost a year now, which is unfortunate, but. I think we're getting ready to really set down some work for it. That's good. Um, no, Tugers, uh, no, I finished my map in about a month for that. Trying to beat the first deadline, but then uh, deadline got extended, so. I think, uh, I think a little longer, and then uh, that might actually get released. We'll see. Yeah, some weird and interesting stuff in that project that i've seen looks kind of cool um, 
aside from that, uh, there's always the possibility of a much larger project in the future I would work on. Hopefully nothing that would take as long to make as judgment overall. <laughs> yeah, but like I said, mammoth. Yeah, there there like I said, there was there was uh outside factors that really slowed down how quickly I could get stuff finished. I'm almost glad though that that is how that ended up. Um because it could have came out in like 2018 as a MBF11 project, right? Right, and, yeah. And uh speedrunners don't like comp level 11 from what I've seen. It it's might not, not a have good, been as popular. Not a great comp level when combat's involved, yeah. Um yeah, I so when I was actually building maps for it, I tried to kind of facilitate uh, minimizing the problems that it introduces for combat. Uh, right. And it really, it, it almost, it almost became not easy to notice those, those changes that NBF 11 brought uh, when I played through the maps. But again, that could also just be bias from having tested them the hundreds of times that I did, you know? Yeah. Well, I guess if you omit a lot of, like, cyber infighting and stuff, then it probably won't be quite as noticeable, because that, for me, is the biggest thing you notice. <laughs> right. Cyber demons just turning around and deciding to kill you uh, at random and, intervals. Yeah. I, I think um, part of part of that, too, is is I try to avoid setting up stuff in such a way that infighting is really easy to facilitate. Um, I guess I'm kind of like anti-infight because it, it kind of it's a little cheesy to me sometimes. Um, not that I particularly try to completely prevent it, you know, uh, but if, if it, I want it to feel earned when it gets set up, I guess. So having having infighting not function normally. Um, it kind of felt like it wasn't a problem because uh the way you would have to set up infighting and in, in maps that I that maps that I was making was it was a process, so by the time it would, would have become a problem, it wasn't a problem anymore, right? Uh that that delay between when monsters wake up and they're allowed to infight in MBF eleven would be over by then. Yeah, right. Definitely a a strange a strange comp level, but also a unique problem to have making a one because that it's very. I mean, it's not used very much in MF11, I suppose. Yeah, and I, I don't think it's gonna really be seen from now on either. Well, yeah, I mean, MF21 does everything because I mean, what was nice about MF11 was that it it did fix a few things that didn't function very well in Boom. Uh, but then it also had the the infighting problem. So MBF twenty one fixes those things, but then it fixes the problems that MBF eleven had. So, and then adds a whole bunch of extra stuff. So really, it's uh, it's just the superior choice now. Right. Uh. So to to the final question, um, what is your favorite Doom monster and why? And maybe, uh, what's your favorite custom monster you made for Judgment and why as well? Okay. Hmm, uh, let's see. If I had to pick a favorite Doom monster. I know someone's going to hate me for saying, uh, but I'd have to say a Pain Elemental, actually. Nice. Uh, they introduce a lot of chaos into scenarios. You know, suddenly there's this thing spitting out uh, lost souls and, and filling the room with nonsense and and they they kind of become a priority and and sometimes that they're just kind of annoying and and they're kind of a funny enemy to to you know, to to play against it, it's it's uh almost like a love hate kind of thing that I have going for them <laughs> a, a lot of a lot of a lot of people really don't like them but uh I think they get a bad rap I think once you um, learn the nuances of dealing with them, they're not too bad. Because I think when you start out, you're like, I can't stop them easily from producing lost souls. I can't, like, I can't use the rocket launcher against them. A lot of people feel like, but uh, if you get right in their face and you can like actually physically block their ability to produce lost souls, which I think is like a really cool aspect of them. 
uh, in terms of like building fights around them. And then the rocket launch is actually really good against them. You just have to get kind of used to the rhythm of fighting them. Yeah. So there's like, yeah. yeah, I think there's a lot of like really cool things that you learn about the pain elemental as you get a bit better at the game. And that's why, along with like target prioritization stuff in, in set pieces, I think they are like just a really unique and really fun monster. There's uh you you mentioned the rocket launcher. That's exactly the inspiration I had for uh map eleven of judgment. Mm-hmm. Um the map you start with a rocket launcher and there's pain elementals. And uh good luck, basically. <laughs> um and uh it was one of those things that a lot of people were really either really uh not enjoying or they really thought it was funny or, or entertaining to play. And of course there's other parts of that map too. There's there's this uh fast melee monsters that I made, the Wraiths, and then there's also the first time you ever encounter the Spider Demolisher. Uh which is perfect because I was gonna segue into that as being my favorite custom enemy that I created for judgment was the Spider Demolisher. Mm-hmm. Um which, you know, it's just the Spider Mastermind, but upgraded. It shoots some rockets here and there, and of course it has a BFG. Um, and it, I, I, I made it because I wanted it, I wanted the Mastermind to not be such a borderline useless most of the time enemy. Yeah. Because they, you know, they get so easily stuck and uh, uh, they just shoot annoying hit scans at you and they'll in fight with everything and uh i really wanted to make them just like a powerhouse like a big threat something that could be built around so something that an entire encounter could be focused on like in map 11 you have the the centerpiece uh of the 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 boss room is where the demolisher is and there's crushers move acting as cover and you have to da- dance around and, and avoid the bfg shots and all that and, and it was kind of an interesting uh way to make the spider mastermind not as much of a pushover yeah and that's a very honorable cause to take up i think because uh they are <laughs> they're almost sad to watch sometimes uh, especially they, in, yeah. in slaughter maps to to see them get took out by like two or three imps that invade their hitbox and just scratch them to death it really is just it's it's hilarious don't get me wrong to see that <laughs> but when when they're supposed to be this big nasty threat it it, it kind of just comes off as silly um yeah i managed to minimize that uh i actually made it to where if you're too close to it, you'll get blast damage. So basically it stomps on you if you're next, like right next to it. So anything that gets too close to it will just get stomped on and, and get killed before it can, before they can uh, just melee attack her to death. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, <laughs> there's a fight at the beginning of entropy where it's imps in a mastermind. And there was more than one occasion where he would literally die to one imp, which wasn't great. Uh, it's so sad. It is, yeah. But, you know, that's just what you have to deal with when you're that gigantic, I guess. Uh, it's just the unfortunate consequence of, of block map stuff, I guess. Yeah, the hitbox is definitely a little bit weird uh, in Doom. Uh, I guess also the consequence of using squares for everything. But, you know, that's what they had to yeah. do at the time. Um, well, yeah, thanks so much for coming on. Razik, it was um really interesting because uh i don't know if i actually mentioned this but i mean i said it was the first time that i was introduced to you the swim with the whale speed run but i think it was like the first doom speed run that i ever actually watched was uh your swim with the whales run oh, wow. so been aware of you for a long time and um always been a huge fan of sf2012 one of my favorite wads um and Judgment is also really cool. I, I've always liked custom monsters, and even though I feel like they're not executed very well a lot of the time, I really liked how how Judgment, like you, went 
the whole hog with it, I feel like, in terms of, like, really putting in a, a ton of custom stuff, like, custom decorations, custom monsters, and uh, I thought it was really fun. So, uh, yeah, really enjoyable chatting to you, and uh, thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. I had a good time. Great. Well, uh, to everyone listening, thank you, and uh, I will return next week with another guest. So, yeah, get, get real pumped up for that one. And uh, I'll see you then. Well, Pixdrift has subscribed to the highest level on Patreon. They are now a Doom God. So I'm, I'm giving them a spicy shout out at the end of the podcast, as promised. Uh, if you'd like your own shout out, uh, you're going to have to match uh, Pixdrift's incredible generosity. So that's really on you. But uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you to all my patrons, but mostly and really only Pixdrift. But yeah, thank you to everyone.